So in chapter four, we studied consciousness and how psychologists go about studying conscious experience and not only what we're aware of in the here and now, but subconscious experience, even dreaming and um, sleep and so forth. And some of the technology that's involved in studying those processes, uh, quite tricky and difficult. Um, this chapter we're moving into, chapter five on learning, we're going to talk about behaviorist a little bit more. And as you guys remember, maybe from the first chapter, behaviorist um, much more into the what they can observe, what they can measure, um, much more in the here and now based. Uh, they don't really care about what you're thinking per se. Your thoughts are not so important to them. Your subconsciousness is not important at all. Um, we're going to look at behavior, observe it, measure it, try to make sense out of it, try to manipulate it at times, which we'll find out can be done. Um, much more different in, in terms of what we'll be looking at. So anyways, chapter five, learning. If you look, guys, at uh, the first couple terms here, learning is simply a systematic, relatively permanent change, relatively permanent in behavior that occurs through experience. Um, yeah, you know, most things that we learn can quite possibly last a, life, a lifetime. Unless we decide we want to change it um, or some other um, processes change it. So the term behaviorism, theory of learning that focuses solely on observable behavior. That's really the key term there, observable. What we can see, what we can measure. That's what we can trust. We can't trust subconscious experience. We can't trust your memory of what you dreamt last night. We really can't. Um, what we can trust is what we can see playing out right in front of us. Uh, discounts importance of mental activity. Yeah, you know, we really don't want to hear about your thoughts. <laughs> we do, but we're not going to put a lot of stock in them. We're going to put stock in what we see happen. Um, so at the bottom there, learning is relatively permanent. Sometimes we can forget what we've learned. Absolutely. Um, also, learning involves experience, different experiences in life and how we, um, how that informed us, how that changed us, how that had something to do with our personality, our habits, um, our our patterns of behavior. Changes in behavior that result from physical maturation uh, would not be considered learning. No, that's different. That's more innate things that are happening. We're talking about more uh, of things that happen due to changes of experience. Um, experiences that occur at different developmental phases of life. Um, experiences that happen on a daily basis. So we're not really looking more at the innate stuff. We're not looking at the physical maturation as it says there. Some of the types of learning we'll be talking about, y'all, it says at the top there, associative learning and conditioning. Um, through association, when two things become connected, associated, uh, when one affects the other, or they're, they're paired together, and we'll talk about how this, this happens. Classical conditioning, uh, opera conditioning, two types of associative learning, which we'll discuss. And then the last type we're going to talk about is observational learning, uh, sometimes called social learning observing and imitating another's behavior. So those are the main types. If you look, you got a couple uh, diagrams there, pictures of classical conditioning versus uh, what we call operant conditioning. And the first one, classical, you can see doctor's office is being closely associated with pain. Yeah, pain of a shot. Listen, you know, I work in a, in a psychiatric clinic and we don't, uh, we're an outpatient psychiatric facility. We don't uh, do shots. But when kids walk into our office for the first time, they, especially young kids, they can become very frightened, very, very scared because they associate um, our office with other doctors, especially um, their physicians or their their pediatrician's office. And so we have to reassure them pretty quickly. No, 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 you're not going to be getting a shot here. Um, this is not going to be a painful thing. Um, but that's the power of association and how it starts to happen really early in, in, in a person's life. Opera condition on the other side there, the behavior swimming in an event, and then there's a consequence. Uh, what sets operant conditioning apart from classical conditioning is consequences. At the heart of operant conditioning, there are always consequences. And we'll, we'll discuss that further. So the term associative learning at the bottom, comparing classical and operant conditioning. Um, in this example of classical conditioning, a child associates doctor's office with getting a painful shot. And then on the right, example of operant conditioning, performing well in a swimming competition uh, becomes associated with getting rewards. Very, very simple. So the first type of learning, classical conditioning, uh, remember this is through association. As it says, they're pairing stimuli together. And Ivan Pavlov was the guy that accidentally discovered this. Um, listen, he was a physician. He wasn't a psychologist by training. 
and he was working on his uh, collecting saliva and and um, looking at the amounts of saliva that was uh, automatically reflexively um, uh, basically um, from a dog. Um, the picture is kind of bad here. You can see it, Pavlov and the white beard there and the dog. But he was collecting a saliva using a dog. And what he used, y'all, let me get, see if I can get a better picture of it. Um, as you can see here, this is how they put the dog in this harness. And there's a tube that went from its mouth uh, basically for collecting saliva. They put a container of meat powder in front of the dog. And then you see the observational screen there. But they would collect it. Um, to find out how many drops of saliva were uh, was being collected as the dog was able to smell and see and sense uh, the meat powder in front of it. So anyways, he was doing experiment, experimental work on, um, on the digestive system, but what they found out, y'all, accidentally, was that this dog um, was not salivating just automatically. Um, they found that it learned to salivate at the sight of not just the food and the meat powder but the person his assistant that was bringing the food in and it was really interesting they they said this can't be something that's automatic or reflexive it's got to be learned so they decided to kind of play around with this experiment with it a little bit by the way he won a nobel prize for his work in digestion but he's known for the salivating dog um, that's why we study pavlov in psychology um, but basically, they were playing around with this a little bit, and they decided, you know what, let's, um, every time the dog, uh, every time we bring the meat powder in, let's do this. Every time we present the food, let's ring a bell. And so let's pair that together. We'll present the food, ring a bell. Present the food, and shortly after that, ring a bell. And the dog would, would salivate, of course. So then they just got rid of the meat powder altogether in the food, and they just would um, present, uh, sorry, they would ring the bell only, and then the dog would salivate. It had learned to salivate to the ringing of a bell because it had paired those two things together. And as you look here, you can see um, the unconditioned stimulus is the food. It hasn't been associated yet, which elicits uh, salivating, which is called the unconditioned response. Um, so before conditioning, the bell is a neutral stimulus that we're going to pair with the food. It has no effect. There's no salivating. So when we pair them up in the bottom part, if you look right, right in this area here, you can see the neutral stimulus is the bell. We pair it with the food. We do this maybe five times, maybe seven times. And the uncondition, unconditioned response is the salivating to the food. But after they've been paired, what becomes, which was neutral before, becomes a conditioned stimulus and it produces a conditioned response, the dog salivating. So all we have to do is ring the bell at this point and the dog salivates. They played around even more. They said, you know what, Let's uh, every time we ring a bell, let's flash the lights. Ring a bell, flash the lights. Ring a bell, flash the lights. And then we've now taken what was a neutral stimulus, the lights. We paired it with the bell and now we just flash the lights and the dog salivates higher order conditioning we've taken it to a secondary level so it's it was it was really interesting I mean this was when we first learned about the conditioning process and how important it is and how we're unconsciously being conditioned the dog was not aware of what was going on it had no decision making it was just reacting and responding to this experiment so um, that that's something really uh, to pay attention to because when we get to opera conditioning you're going to see how it's slightly different than that Another classic experiment in conditioning was done on humans, and it was done on 11-month-old uh, little Albert, and it's called the Little Albert Experiment, very uh, well known, and controversial because by today's ethics, it is something we would never do. However, um, 1920, it was being done uh, to little Albert. Uh, John B. Watson and uh, Rosalind Rayner were partners in, and Watson was really spearheading it, but um, they basically took this 11-month-old Albert and they uh, got him, they, they, they basically put together a makeshift crib, and in this crib he kind of sat there, and they would bring in a little white rat, a little lab rat, and there was no observable negative emotion in little Albert. He didn't respond in a bad way. Actually, there was curiosity on his face, and there was even laughter. And So they continued to get little Albert used to the little white rat, 
and no negative emotion was ever shown just good stuff and he actually would reach out and try to touch the white rat he was really curious and uh, so at some point they decided okay every time we bring in the white rat uh, Watts would take this big rod and he'd bang on the crib really loud bang 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 you know it would startle little Albert little Albert would freak out and cry scream uh, the noise of course startled Albert so they paired those things together they bring in the white rat bang on the crib, bring in the white rat, bang on the crib. And every time, uh, Albert would scream and cry, of course. So um, now we're not going to bang in, on the crib. We're just going to bring in the white rat. We paired that together maybe five times, maybe for seven times. Now all we have to do is bring in the white rat, and little Albert, you guessed it, he screams and cries at the sight of the white rat. We've conditioned him into being afraid of the white rat. Prior, no, no problem. Now we've conditioned fear. We've taken a little 11 month old. I know this is pretty sad. In the video that you guys probably watched, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's a little disturbing doing that to such a young child. But um, it was interesting that we, we learned that we can condition people. Um, and that's what we think is kind of behind phobias today. We think some folks have probably been conditioned to fear things and they don't even realize what was the original stimulus that produced the fear. Now they only go with the associated stimulus and that's what causes their fear. So this is really important, um, but at the same time, by today's standards, we can't do this kind of experiment. Do no harm. Uh, they never did recondition little Albert, and story goes that he developed some type of serious illness um, and died, I think, early in life, around uh, two or three, or, 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 you know, he didn't live that long, and he was never reconditioned. They never got him to... Um, not fear what was white and fuzzy and so forth. And by the way, he not only was afraid of the white rat, he would generalize that fear onto anything that was white and fuzzy um, or anything that was fuzzy, you know, the, little, the white, the rabbit there in the picture, you know, afraid of a, a bunny. Um, he was afraid of a Santa Claus beard. There's video f uh, clips of Albert um, being very afraid as Watson wearing like a Santa Claus beard is like hovering over him and he's screaming and crying. White cotton balls, he, he become afraid of those things. So conditioning, um, after he's been conditioned, we can generalize um, the results, generalizing on the things that are very similar in, in look and feel, etc. A few terms I want you all to be aware of with classical conditioning. The first one is acquisition. Uh, learning of connection between the unconditioned stimulus and the conditioned stimulus. Contingency. There needs to be a close amount of time between the two. You cannot let a, a large amount of time or a long period of time uh, go on between the food and the bell. The bell has to follow the food pretty closely for the effect to work. If you let it linger for a minute or two, then you've missed your window of opportunity. It needs to be within seconds for the most part. Contingency. The bell is a reliable indicator. Um, yeah, you know, the bell had to be something that the dog probably had never heard before, had been exposed to some type of um, um, new type of um, stimulus, which would be a, a good one. It says, imagine that the dog in Pavlov's experiment is exposed to a ringing bell at random times all day long. Well, then it's not going to have the effect. It's It's got to be a, a good indicator and something that's, um, that's uh, um, new and... Um, Generalization, I just mentioned this a little while ago, says little Albert generalizing the fear onto rabbits, cotton balls, Santa Claus beard, anything white and fuzzy basically. So it's the stimulus to the conditioned uh, stimulus elicits a response similar to the conditioned response. Discrimination, um, little Albert being able to discriminate between a white rat and cotton balls. As he gets older, you guys, he's going to develop that ability to where, you know, had little Albert lived a long time, he would get to the point where he could discriminate between what he should fear and what he should not fear. So, yeah, at three, four, five, maybe still afraid of a white rat, but not so much Santa Claus's beard or white cotton fuzzy balls. He can discriminate between the two at that point. Um, that's typically what happens. Two other terms. Extinction. Weakening of the conditioned response when the unconditioned stimuli is absent. Says without the continued association between the two, the conditioned stimulus loses its power, so eventually the power of the fear associated with white rat would be weakened and not scare little Albert so much. So when he's 10, 15, you know, there might be apprehension, there might still be uneasiness, but the, the power weakens over time is basically what we're saying here. Spontaneous recovery, it can come back up again. This is reoccurrence of it. 
so a long time can go on and then all of a sudden you can have um, a spontaneous recovery of something that you were afraid of a long time ago haven't been afraid for a long time now but something sets it off and it comes back pretty strong